Good morning and welcome to Teambridge Methodist Church's Zoom service for today, Sunday the 16th of October. And this morning we're going to be led um, in service by uh, with Andrew Parsons. So thank you, Andrew. Good morning. It is lovely to be back with you again. And as Jeff reminded me last time, it wasn't very long, going to be very long before you had to put up with me again. I think it's been three weeks. But let's just open our uh, meeting just with a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we have come into your presence this morning to worship you and to praise you. Lord, be with us as we take part in the service and join with us as we are here to join with you. Amen. We're going to start with an opening hymn, which is an exceptionally well, well-known one, and it just reminds us of just what God has done for us. Great is thy faithfulness.
Now we're going to be coming to the first reading, which is Jeremiah 31, which does remind us of God's faithfulness. And it's going to be read to us this morning by Norma. I, the Lord, say that the time is coming when I will fill the land of Israel and Judah with people and animals. And just as I took care to uproot, to pull down, to overthrow, to destroy, and to demolish them, so I will take care to plant them and to build them up. When that time comes, people will no longer say, the parents ate the sour grapes, but the children got the sour taste. Instead, whoever eats sour grapes will have his own teeth set on edge, and everyone will die because of his own sin. The Lord says, the time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach his fellow countrymen to know the Lord, because all will be known, all will know me, from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins, and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. Thank you to God. Thank you, Norma. The words of God there, he is... We've just celebrated recently harvest and we've looked at the new seeds being planted and everything coming to fruition. And in this reading, we're reminded of that. And we're also reminded that God has a plan and is moving things forward. And I like verse 29, where it says to us that in the version I read, it it came up that when that, that time comes, you won't hear the old proverb anymore. Parents at the green apples their children got the stomach ache. No, each person will pay for his own sin. You eat green apples, you're the one who gets sick. Now, God has given us an option of of coming through and being made right and whole with him. And the rest of this passage talks about the new covenant that God is going to make with us, his people. Each one of us makes an individual covenant with God. And he says that this is a brand new covenant that I will make with Israel. I will put my law into their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. This is our God who is faithful and who can be trusted to do what he says he's going to do. This service, as we move through it this morning, hopefully will bring us to that concentration point of thinking that We can trust God to do all that he says he is going to do. And to bring us into that frame of mind, our next hymn is really a prayer asking God to be the centre of our lives and where we are. And it's Be Thou My Vision. We want God to be the centre of where we are looking. Oh 
Now that hymn brings us, first of all, to another hymn, Psalm 119, and that's going to be read by Ali, I believe. Psalm 119, verses 97 to 104, reading from the New Living Translation. Oh, how I love your instructions. I think about them all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are my constant guide. Yes, I have more insight than my teachers, for I am always thinking of your laws. I am even wiser than my elders, for I have kept your commandments. I have refused to walk on any evil path so that I may remain obedient to your word. I haven't turned away from your regulations, for you have taught me well. How sweet your words taste to me, they are sweeter than honey. Your commandments give me understanding. No wonder I hate every false way of life. Thank you, Ali. Now those words bring us to our time of prayer, of thanksgiving and just rejoicing in what God has given to us and then we're going to lead that into the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and mighty God, we thank you this morning for all that you have given to us. And Lord, thinking on the readings that we've already read, we thank you that you made that promise that you would instill within us a new heart you would make us whole with you lord we praise you and we thank you that that has come to pass and lord we do indeed say as in the book of psalms that your words are sweeter than honey in our mouths and lord we want to thank you and rejoice in all that you have given us Lord, we sometimes fail to acknowledge just how much we owe to you. For Lord, you gave yourself freely for each one of us, that we might have life and life in abundance, that we should be able to be with you in paradise, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and us, all sharing together, to worship and to praise you. Lord, you are the almighty God, the king of creation. You are above all creatures and all gods. You are the holy of holies. And Lord, we praise you. Lord, we thank you for all those things that you have given to us that we take for granted. For, the, for nature, for food, and for clothing, Lord. Lord, we thank you that without your abundance, we would have nothing. And Lord, we thank and praise you that in giving us our material needs you have also supplied our physical needs you have given us the hope of new life the assurance that as we come to you to bow down before you and accept that we are sinners all we need to do is to repent and to turn away from our old life and to walk with you in a new and living way Lord, we acknowledge before you this morning that we are sinners. But Lord, we are not sinners without hope. We are sinners that who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Lord, by your sacrifice on the cross, you have set us free and made each one of us a new creation. So Lord, at this time, we just once more come before you and acknowledge our failings and ask that you would forgive us for those but build us up anew 
and strengthen us that next time we will be able to go longer and further without stumbling, without tripping. For Lord, we want to serve you every day of our lives. Thank you, Lord God Almighty. Amen. And now we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever amen We're going to sing another couple of songs now, which Carol's going to put up one after the other. And the first one is As the Deer Pants for the Water. And then we're going to sing together, Purify My Heart.
heart Let me be as gold Pure gold Refine as fire My heart's one desire Is to be And that hymn brings us to our next reading, which Carol is going to ring, read to us from Luke 18. The reading is taken from Luke 18, verses 1 to 8. And I'm reading from the Good News Bible. When Jesus told his disciples a par parable to teach them that they should always pray and never become discouraged. In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that same town who kept coming to him and pleading for her rights, saying, help me against my opponent. For a long time, the judge refused to act. But at last he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or respect man, yet because of all the trouble this widow is giving me, I will see to it that she gets her rights. If I don't, she will keep on coming and finally wear me out. And the Lord continued, listen to what that corrupt judge said. Now will God not now. Will God not judge in favour of his own people who cry to him day and night for help? Will he be slow to help them? I tell you, he will judge in their favour and do it quickly. But will the Son of Man find faith on earth when he comes? This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Carol. It's going to bring me to my time of my reflection on 
how I've been really led to where I am this morning. But if I do, let's just have one quick word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we each read your word in our own way. And we all hear you speaking to us. Lord, I pray this morning that there will be parts of this message which will speak to people in, as individuals. For some, you will highlight one thing. For others, you will highlight another. But Lord, I just pray that you will speak to each one of us to enable us to hear your word being spoken through me. Lord, bless the words that I say and let your spirit enable us to hear what you are saying to each one of us individually. Amen. Now, in this passage, I was a little bit concerned when I looked at the readings for today and looked at the passage from Luke as the suggested reading for the day, and I was going to give it a miss. Not because it was awkward or difficult, but simply down to the fact that I didn't think at first there was a lot to see because we all have heard the message so many times. And yet there's some lots of points in this reading that we've read together. That, and it was the final verse from Luke that stood out to me. And it's the question by Jesus, which asks how much of that kind of persistent faith will the Son of Man find on earth when he returns? Now, that's a challenge, or at least that's how I see it, to each one of us, that we need to ensure the fact that we constantly come back to God. You know, as we look at the scripture in more detail, we remember that the reason for the story is to encourage each one of us to be earnest in our prayers and to never, never give up. So Jesus tells this story of the necessity for people to pray consistently and to never quit. Jesus knew that for so many of us, it is difficult to, for us to believe, firstly, that God will actually listen to our prayers because we don't consider them to be important enough. And secondly, that he would be prepared to act on them, even if he did hear our prayers. As humans, we are wonderful at self-doubt, self-deprecating, not thinking that we are important enough. But this morning, God is saying to each one who hears this message that you are important and I listen and I am acting on your behalf. You know, for many of us, it may be that we've been let down in the past by friends who've turned around to us and said, if you need anything, just ask. If ever, ever there is anything I can help with, don't forget to ask. I'm here. And then we get to our time of need and we seek help and they just turn their back. And I think sometimes because of those letdowns, we struggle to believe that God wants to do it and will do it. I can remember many instances myself in my own life when I've been at my wit's end and have approached people who have offered help and advice. If ever you get in a difficult situation, come to me. And yet when I have done there, I've discovered that they're only empty words. They me meant nothing. It was just something you say at the time to make things easier. Well, the difference is with Jesus and with God is that he tells us to take his, yo his yoke upon us. He wants to share our burdens, our difficulties, and those problems that we face on a day-to-day -day basis. With God, they are not empty words. They are words full of meaning, and he wants to be part of us. So, 
we've said that these rejections tend to color our thinking and they make us, I think, sometimes slightly reluctant to approach God with our deepest needs. You know, Jesus speaks to us often about God being our loving father and that we can trust him to do what is best for us. Perhaps we don't all have good experiences of being able to approach our parents when we are in a time of need. But most of us have experiences of some people who have stood out because they go that extra mile to a help and to assist. But because those rejections of bad experiences have an impact on us, we can sometimes struggle to be prepared to trust God for what is best for us. So that's my starting point, if you like. This is where we are coming at with God, that we can trust God to do what is best for us. We see from the creation of man back in the Old Testament and in Genesis and all the way through the scriptures, God is interceding on behalf of his people. God is an enabler. He wants us to grow. And ultimately, we saw in the crucifixion of Jesus just how far God and Jesus, as his son, was prepared to go to help and to assist. So when he says, I am there, ask of me, he means everything he says. So in this story, we have a judge. And it makes it very clear he doesn't fear God or man. He trusts only in himself and does only what benefits him. I'm sure we can all think in our mind's eye of people that we know that are like that. And we've probably heard people like that make promises. And this man, no doubt, when he was made to be a judge, made a, pr a promise to serve the people and to judge fairly and to be honest and open. But there's a widow who comes to him with who has been wronged and is in search of justice. We're not told how many times she came to him searching for help. But it's very clear that she's been brushed off numerous times. He never once gave her the time of day. Yet, as she persisted, coming back day after day, he relented. He wasn't listening because she was in the right or even because it benefited him. He chose to help simply because he got fed up with her constant pestering about her needing help. He chose to help to avoid, in the words of the message, being beaten black and blue. I think that's very figurative. But we all know what it's like when someone keeps harping on and harping on and harping on. In the end, we have to just either go away or deal with it because it's not going to dealt with, be dealt with otherwise. So this woman has started off asking politely. She's come to him and says, sir, I need you to help. This has happened. That's happened. And I need some assistance to stop and, and to help it. It was an act which she had every right and was entitled to receive. Yet he was not interested. And in fact, the passage says to us, because this widow won't quit badgering me, I'd better do something and see that she gets justice. This man, this judge, was full of faults. And yet, ultimately, he helped. And Jesus says, do you hear what that judge, corrupt he, as he is, is saying? What makes you think that God won't step in and work justice for his chosen people? Who continue to cry out for help? Won't he stick up for them? I assure you, he will. Now, that passage is from the message. 
And I know it's slightly different to the version that we read and listened to together. But I sometimes feel that the message just emphasizes how much God wants to help us. So Jesus brought us back to this to hear what the judge has said. The fact that he just chooses to help, though he is corrupt, he has chosen to help. God is not cor corrupt. And this is the comparison that Jesus is making. Do you think that God won't step in and work justice for his chosen people who choose to, and continue to cry out for help? Won't he stick up for them? I assure you, he will. He cares. He cares about our physical needs, our mental needs, our financial needs. The list goes on and on and on. And we need to come to God in prayer. We need to know that God is interested in each one of us. And I don't know whether there's anyone here listening this morning or perhaps at a later time on the video who feels that they're unimportant, who feels that to God they are insignificant. All I can say is that in this passage, God is telling you that you are the most important person to him. You and you alone, Jesus died for. Yes, he's died for others, but you, in God's mind, is who Jesus died for. You know, perhaps when we come to God, and this is another question, is we come with prayer requests and we don't see immediate answers. And therefore, we automatically assume that we were praying for the wrong thing or that it wasn't important enough for God to even take time to listen to. Jesus himself said that there are some things that can only be attained through prayer and fasting. That in itself shows a level of persistence and a firm intent to see God respond to our prayers. We have to be fervent in our prayers. We have to mean them. We have to expect God to listen. As a parent and a grandparent, I know I don't look old enough, but there's times, aren't there, when you know that to give something as soon as it is requested is not the right thing to do. With a child, if they come and ask for sweets, sometimes it's the right time sometimes it's the wrong time if it's just before a meal they fill themselves up then won't eat the food so there's that's a simple one but it's gifts it's presents and and they can take too much for granted jesus treats us as children in some ways because as children we have a habit of asking for things that are not necessarily needed we feel that we need them. We feel that if we could do this or we could do that, then that would be the answer to all of life's problems. Sometimes we need to wait for either the right time or more often than not, we have to look for a different solution to what we expected because God may well have already answered the prayer but it hasn't come in the way that we expected him to answer. God is not like the judge who makes us wait for no good reason. I can't say why we don't always see immediate answers, but I am confident that God does respond. In the book of Thessalonians, chapter 5, verse 17, it's a very brief verse. It says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Prayer is a constant state of mind and it's where our heart needs to be. Not because it makes us more spiritual, but it keeps us close to God. In the earlier reading from Jeremiah, 
we looked at very, very briefly and very quickly earlier on. It said that the, this is a brand new covenant that I will make with Israel. When the time comes, I will put my law within them, write it in on their hearts and be their God, and they will be my people. They will no longer go around setting up schools to teach each other about God. They'll know me firsthand, the dull and the bright, the start smart and the slow. I'll wipe the slate clean for each of them. I'll forget they ever sinned. This is our God. This is who we are coming to with our prayers, with our petitions. And in Psalms, we read the passage that it says, you, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. With the law of God written on our hearts and God's commands being ever within us, how can we fear that God will not listen to and act upon our prayers, our petitions, our very real needs? So as we look at the words of Jesus one final time, we keep coming back to him with our needs and desires. And Jesus' question, but how much of that kind of persistent faith will the Son of Man find on the earth when he returns? Currently, we are seeing dwindling numbers in our churches. We don't need to be despairing about that, but we need to be seeking God's will even more and to constantly come to him in prayer that his message will get out to others. We need to come believing that it is, is God's will to answer these prayers and to restore his people. We need to be like the persistent widow and never give up. Great revivals have come about through the persistent prayers of a few committed people. Israel learned the hard way that God keeps his promises. They were put into slavery. They spent 40 years in the wilderness. They were put into exile. Throughout it all, all these times when people felt that God had deserted them, there was a remnant of believers who continued to trust in God and speak his word. And God did keep his word. From the line of David came one who would take away the sins of the world. So this morning, and this is my final sentence, let us this morning be a part of that remnant, a people who trust in God unfailingly and continue daily with our prayers and our petitions. We're going to have another hymn. Now, after the hymn, we'll have our prayers of intercession. But the hymn is Seek Ye First the Kingdom of God. It is as we seek God that we know what we need to pray about. Seek Ye First.
Let us pray. Lord, that prayer tells us to continue to pray. Lord, not just to pray for ourselves, but we are encouraged to pray for others. So as we come to this time of intercession, we think away from our own responsibility from ourselves and we think of others. So, Lord, we think this morning of those that are known to the church in our locality who are in need. We lift them before you, Lord. We pray that you will uphold them, bless them and renew them. Lord, for those that don't know you, we pray that your Holy Spirit may enable them to recognise you for who you are. And Lord, we pray that we as a church are able to assist. We pray that you will open up doors. But doors, when they are opened, need to have someone there with a message. So, Lord, enable us to share. Lord, enable us to share with our community where there is a need, whether it is physical, whether it is mental, whether it is financial. Lord, let us help where we can. We know there are many people in need that physically we cannot help with their circumstances. But Lord, you are above all of that. You can intercede and do all things, for you are the mighty creator God. So Lord, we come to you this morning and lift these people up before you and ask that you touch them. Lord, we pray yet again this morning for our country as we see it going through a calamitous time. Lord, we pray that you will lift up in government a governing people that will listen to your word and will do the right thing. So, Lord, we pray for those in power. We pray that they will seek the right answers. Even when there are many different views and opinions, we pray, Lord, that they will come to the right decisions. And Lord, we pray for this world as we see so much fighting and violence, hatred and pain being inflicted by one person to another. We pray for peace. Lord, we know we need to keep coming back to you time and time and time again with this prayer. But Lord, we are not daunted. We stand secure in the knowledge of your word. So we do indeed pray for peace. Lord, we pray for those people who have been impacted over the last few weeks with natural disasters, floods and famine. Lord, we lift them before you. And we pray for the people who distribute aid from whatever agency they come to help. We lift them before you, Lord, that the required help goes out. Give us the faith, Lord, that we can trust that you are answering these prayers. Bless those that we know that are in need. And Lord, we pray together now for those who are here during this service or those that are watching the service at a later time. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will touch each one and that, Lord, we all will know 
that we are meeting in the presence of the living God. Restore us, Lord. Renew us and make us a people of prayer who trust you to enable us to do your will. Amen. We come to our final hymn, and that is Tell Out My Soul. We have got a message to give. It's a message of wonder and of might and of a God who is all powerful. Tell out my soul. Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. Unnumbered blessings give my spirit voice tender to me. Gracious and almighty God, bless each one of us. Lord, let us trust in you. Let us believe that you are listening to our prayers and are acting upon them. So, Lord, as we leave our time of fellowship and go into the world, we stand steadfast in the knowledge that your blessings surround us day by day and that you will renew our hearts and restore us before you. Amen. So up on the screen now we have the Teambridge Methodist Circuit Church is all shown and an email address should anybody want to contact us about any issues that might have been raised or questions that you have, please contact us on the email address or if you have access to any of the people who are, I'm sure they'd be pleased to answer. But I just pray that God will bless you from all those on the Coastal Methodist Circuit and Teambridge Methodist Circuit Churches as a whole.
Thank you.